Hello and welcome to BC Sport TV. We are here at the home of the county champions Warwickshire Cricket Club and lovely background picture here at the Edgbaston Stadium. And the gentleman next to me need no introduction. Director of Cricket here at Warwickshire County Cricket Club, Paul Fabris, and also former England and Sri Lanka T20 winning coach. Thank you very much for your time here, Paul. No problem. Pleasure. Nice to have you here. Wonderful indeed, Paul. Before we talk about the ICC T20 Super 12 review, if you just explain your strategy behind the county champions. You came here, you had a strategy to become second in the county overall table by 2025, but 2021 you're all champions. Well, uh, the, the, we've set a, a strategy as we have for the whole business. So the whole club has strategies. Um, and within Inspire Through Winning Teams, which is our cricket strategy, we wanted to win the county championship by 2024. And our goal for this season, with the three groups of six, was to get into the top division of what we called Super September, because we wanted to see how far we'd come as a team. It was really important to judge ourselves against the best. And we wanted to be in that top division of the top six. Now, that meant we had to finish in the top two of our group, which we did. And we went into the into the top division, which we were delighted by. And that was our goal. To then win the county championship was an absolute bonus. But Mark Robinson, when he joined us at the start of the year, talked about when we win, not if we win. And that was something that he has pushed throughout the club. It's something that's been a bit of a strap line for us as a club. Um, and he's talked to the players consistently about when. But winning games of cricket sounds easy, but everybody wants to win. And we found that we gained momentum from winning two early games against Notts and Essex. And then we got into that top division. And the reason we were so keen to get in that top division was, as I said, was to test ourselves and find out how good we really were and how much progress we were making. Um, and after two games, a draw at Old Trafford against Lancashire, a loss here against Hampshire, um, it looked as though we still had a lot of work to do. And then the win at Yorkshire at Headingley, uh, it was fantastic. It gave everyone a lot of confidence. Chris Wokes came back into that game. Tim Bresnan came back into that game. And we went into the last game here with one of four teams who had a chance to win the county championship. So to go into the last day, the last session, and to win it on the last session here in front of our home supporters was a fantastic way to finish the season. But, and it is a but, we're not patting ourselves on the back too much because our goal is still to win the championship again by 2024. Our goal next year is to finish in the top three of Division 1 and then the following two years is to finish in the top two with a view of winning it again in one of those two years. So that, that's our goal. We want to be consistent. Um, we want to keep winning matches and we want to be talking about being the team that everybody else wants to be and, and not have any fears about that. I'm not saying we're going to win it every year. Yeah. I'm not being arrogant in that way. But I think it's important that we talk about winning and we have an expectation around winning because that's what we want to do. And we want to, we want to talk about being a good team. We want to talk about getting better and keep improving all the time. But it's important that our players are comfortable with other teams coming here and wanting to beat us because that shows that we are setting standards and we want to be one of those teams that is up there setting standards. And also, it's uh, very fascinating to watch in terms of leadership, uh, the positive note uh, that you all speak and communicate with the team. It's not uh, if we win, it's when we win. So that gives uh, loads of um, uh, uh, attitude, behavioural aspect as well in terms of your team. And uh, talking about all the youngsters coming in, that's a great sign. It's a fantastic sign. We, we have three very key things. When I came to the club, the three key things for me that were really important was that we developed a spine of homegrown players that came through our pathway into the first team. We also wanted to develop players to go on and play for England at all levels, play international cricket. And the last part of that is to win trophies. Now, this year we had six players selected to go on winter tours. Jacob Bethel going with the Young Lions. We had four players selected to go with the England Lions. And Chris Wokes obviously in the main Ashes side. Um, so we, we were delighted with that. We've won the county championship. We won the Bob Willis Trophy. Um, and we have got a lot of exciting young players coming through our pathway, both boys and girls. And, and it's really important that those youngsters realise there is opportunity to get in the first team. And it isn't blocked at any stage. So even our second eleven 
at one point in the season in August, we played Worcestershire away. Worcestershire put out pretty much their first team in the second team four-day game. And we opened the batting with two under-15 lads. Um, so Amir Khan, Hamza Sheikh. And, you know, we, we want to create the opportunity for those young players, not just to play in the second eleven and bat at seven or eight, but to bat in their key positions. So those two in Amir and Hamza opened the batting. And the experience they got from playing against Worcestershire's top quality bowlers on a first class ground was fantastic. Now, it, we, we didn't win the game, but that wasn't what the game was about for us. It was about developing our youngsters giving our youngsters the opportunity. Manraj Jahal is another great example of a lad. The last second 11 game against Gloucester, he got five for in both innings. He therefore got selected on merit to play in the game at Lords against Lancashire in the Bob Willis Trophy and bowled exceptionally well. Now, to make his debut at Lords in, in a live television game, that's fantastic for that young man. But he deserved it. He's earned his place in the side. Um, and it's really important that we keep showing these young players if you perform, if you score runs and take wickets, you will get into the second 11. And if you do it in the second 11 consistently, you will get in the first 11. And that's a really important message to send out to all of our young players in our pathway. Wonderful science in terms of a development pathway. A big kudos to Mark Robinson, the head coach, who's uh, right in front of us uh, behind our cameras or in front of us. Uh, but uh, let's move on to uh, ICC Cricket World Cup. We'll talk about uh, the four who will play the semi-finals. Uh, but before that, a uh, sudden exit of India, everyone is talking about. Uh, in terms of mental toughness and fatigue, even the retiring coach, Ravi Shastri, he did uh, express that, uh, stating uh, that uh, with the bubble for six months, it's always uh, tough. Uh, but understanding that, where do you think India went wrong, wrong in terms of uh, playing the IPL and uh, in UAE and then setting up to a gestion? How do you see on, in your point of view? Well, I, I think Ravi Shastri is absolutely right. You know, the Indian team play a lot of cricket. You know, that they are the marquee team at the moment around the world. Everybody wants to play India. The pressure that is on the Indian players is immense. And, you know, I, I think any, anybody that's ever been to India to watch cricket and to watch international cricket will know that the pressures that those players play under is phenomenal. I mean, Sachin Tendulkar, to play the amount of cricket that he played under the pressure of carrying the hopes and the dreams of that cricket-loving, absolutely cricket-mad nation, fantastic. So when people say to me, oh, Lara Tendulkar, Tendulkar wins every single time because, you know, he, he carried the nation on his shoulders as MS Dhoni has done, as Virat Kohli is doing now and so many other great players have done. I, I think the fact that they went to play the IPL in, had to continue in the UAE, I think has probably drained them in terms of the bubbles that they've been in. A lot of people thought it would be a massive advantage to the Indian team, but actually it hasn't turned out that way. But I do think that we expect so much of the Indian team. You know, Virat Kohli, you know, epitomises everything that is great about Indian cricket. He has changed the Indian team. They are now a very tough team to play against home and away. It used to be you go to India, India would beat you comfortably with spinning pitches, high quality batters. They can win anywhere now. They showed that in Australia last year. You know, that they, they have shown that here in England this summer. They can win anywhere. They've got high quality bowling attack. They've got fantastic spinners. They've got some of the best batters in the world without a shadow of a doubt. Virat Kohli, as I say, plays with such passion, plays with such a, a front foot mentality. He wants to take the opposition on all the time. I love the way he plays the game. So look, I'm, I'm not surprised that um, they've come unstuck a little bit because... We expect so much of them. We demand so much of them. And the Indian public expects so much and demand so much of them. And the players are used to that. But they are human beings at the end of the day. They're not machines. And it's no surprise that they've had a tough period. But, you know, don't write them off for too long. They'll be back. And, and they'll be back winning trophies, winning tournaments. I, I think, you know, that in the end, the right two teams got to the test playing World Cup. Now, you can say that New Zealand played a lot of their games at home. Fine, no problem. But New Zealand and India have two fantastic teams. Two fantastic balanced bowling attacks. Um, they have excellent batting throughout. And that they're very well organised teams. And I think they are the teams that are setting the, the trends across world cricket at the moment. Um, so, look, let, let's... We're disappointed that India are not in the semi-finals because I think I predicted they would be in the semi-finals. I thought India, West Indies would definitely be in the, in the semi-finals and both have proved me wrong. But it just goes to show that the T20 game 
um, the game can swing and change very, very quickly. But, you know, really disappointed India are not there. At the same time, um, it has been tough and they do play a lot of cricket. So no surprise, really. It's quite intriguing to see that uh, some of the not informed teams, they really played well in this tournament, something like New Zealand, and they lost to Bangladesh series for the first time. And Bangladesh, on the other hand, played really well in their home team. They beat New Zealand and they beat Australia convincingly. But when they came into World Cup, but it didn't go according to plan. Where do you think this systematical wrong, which, which went wrong to Bangladesh? Well, I think you've only got to look at the pitches that Bangladesh have been playing on in recent years. You know, they've been winning comfortably at home, but they, they need to test their players on pitches that are really good. They don't play enough cricket around the world to constantly play on the pitches they've been playing on at home. So I think Bangladesh have learned a huge lesson. They've got to play on better pitches at home. They, they are very capable of producing excellent pitches in Bangladesh. They've got some highly talented players in their team. Um, I think they need to play on good pitches. I think they need to play on better pitches. They don't play enough cricket to limit their opportunities by playing on the surfaces they've been playing on. So when they do play away from home, as they have done in the UAE, they've come unstuck. Now, there's no way that they should have played five, lost five. They're, they're a lot better team than that. They've got a lot more skill in that team. Um, and, and for whatever reason, it just hasn't worked for them. But the T20 World Cup, historically, Bangladesh haven't done very well. You know, they, they've hardly beaten a major nation in the tournament since it started. And that's remarkable given the amount of quality that they have in their team. So that they've got some work to do to catch up and they know that as well. Um, it, it's, it's been a fascinating World Cup though, hasn't it? It really, it's been a brilliant World Cup, you know, right from the, you know, the early stage of, you know, Pakistan beating India and the way that they beat them in that game in Dubai really, I think, was a a huge turning point for this World Cup. It was an eye-opener for everybody and I think it's really caught everybody's imagination. Absolutely, indeed. You mentioned about the Bangladesh performance in the world stage, but let's talk about uh, Sri Lanka's performance in the World uh, World Cup, especially they are very good. You won the T20 World Cup in 2014 under Lasit Malinga. You were part of the great players. Uh, you coached like uh, greats like Kumar Sangakkara, Mahila Jayawardhan, T.M. Dilshan. So, uh, giving that uh, factor before Sri Lanka coming into this World Cup, uh, people thought, for instance, that uh, they won't even qualify, uh, get through from the qualifiers. But uh, it proved out to be lots of talent coming in. They finished fourth in the table. Look, I, I think the Sri Lankan team have shown um, everybody that they've got some seriously talented young players coming through. Their big issue has been their chopping and changing of selection. They, they chop and change their selection panel too often. And therefore, you know, the, the different selection panels chop and change their players. Um, and that doesn't allow for any consistency. And I would think that that's the biggest um, issue that they need to, to sort out and, and to get right. Because we've seen in this World Cup, there's a lot of talent in Sri Lanka. There's an awful lot of talent. They're a very young side. Um, perhaps like one or two senior, real senior quality players to get them through. But I think Sri Lanka has got so many talented cricketers. Absolutely, I mean, that they they really do. The, the big issue, and it was the same with the 2019 50-over World Cup here in England, they came without some of their key players. They weren't sure about their selections. They were muddled in their thinking. And it led to them not playing very well in that tournament. But I think we've seen enough in this tournament to know that there's some seriously talented youngsters but the selection has to be right. You can't keep chopping and changing and dropping players after one series, one game, because that doesn't allow players to feel at home, to feel settled and <coughs> pardon me, and know that they have one bad game or two bad games, that they're out of the team. And that's one of the things that that's one of the reasons why England have done so well. Owen Morgan, once he picks a team to play the first game of a series, as he has done in this World Cup, he sticks with those players. And if you go and play T20 cricket where it's about being absolutely on the front foot in everything that you do in the field, keeping wicket, batting, bowling, taking positive options, occasionally you're going to get it wrong, occasionally you're going to get out and occasionally you're going to bowl a bad ball. But if you get dropped after one game or two games, it's very hard then for players to play their natural progressive game. And I think that's the one thing that Sri Lanka need to sort out more than anything else be consistent with your selection, be consistent with your selectors and actually you might surprise yourself because there's some seriously talented players. That's some wonderful encouraging news. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Paul. Uh, now let's talk about the semi-finals, all important semi-finals. England coming as favourites for this tournament and they're well 
uh, paid a well just deserve to be in the semi finals and talking about new zealand england clash tomorrow um is that a revenge time for new zealand uh, considering the 2019 world cup look new, it's no surprise new zealand are in the semi final you know they're a very well coached very well organized forward thinking team they always have been and it's no surprise you know they've been in the world test championship final the the last um world cup 50 over final at lords which they came incredibly close to winning um you know and then you you come to this semi final it's no surprise they have got some fantastic players they've got some brilliant players their bowling attack is excellent um real good experience in their bowling attack high quality batting power throughout their side it's no surprise that they've got through to this stage it really isn't but england are going to have to play well you know england i think will have learned a lesson from their last game um but look, england look such a balanced team they they've had a couple of unfortunate injuries um but they look very balanced very well organized they look like the team to me who are full of confidence they know their roles in the team and it doesn't matter you know if they've lost a couple of players it's unfortunate for Ty Mal Mills because you know Ty is someone who has suffered some really horrible setbacks in terms of injuries everyone was so pleased to see him get in that team Owen Morgan showed his real strength as a captain 12 months ago he talked about Ty being a possibility and being back in that team and I I thought it was fantastic the way that he did that he gave him that encouragement he allowed him to play and develop and and he picked him and it's such a shame that he, he is injured but you can bring in other high quality players I said four or five years ago that at one point I thought we had about 24 25 players that we could pick for any white ball series of 15 players and England have shown that you know they brought James Vince in now to the squad they brought Reese Topley into the squad they've still got Liam Dawson sat there as a non-travelling reserve David Willey is in that squad as well Sam Billings is in that squad Mark Woods only played one game you know that the, the, the strength and depth in their team is fantastic um, and as I say they know their roles they know they're well supported by the best captain in world cricket in white ball world cricket at the moment and someone who expects to win that team expect to win they're not hoping to win they expect to win and that's something that they've talked a lot about they've talked about being the favourites going into tournaments and enjoying being the favourites not being scared of being the favourites not being put under pressure by being the favourite but enjoy that enjoy people wanting to be you enjoy wanting to be the best and that's it's quite an un-English thing to do but it's a really important thing and the players are thriving off that so whatever way they go with their selection England have got a team capable of winning this tournament but as we've seen so far you know anything can happen in the semi-final and whoever plays their best hopefully will get through and i hope that it's england but you know the new zealand team will say that they fancy their chances even could have been a super over who be never know we have to wait and see tomorrow but in terms of let's hope not let's hope not in terms of adjusting to conditions we witnessed that england played their most games in abu dhabi and dubai and they went came to sharjah played against sri lanka all of a sudden 3 4 wickets for like 50 60 odd and Josh Butler we saw how we yeah. well he adjusted to the slow pitches at Sharjah and they went on he went on scoring a century there so uh, same thing happened against uh, last game against south africa in terms of uh, identify the uh, adjusting to condition but i think england had a slight chance on that they, they did really well and they also have the options now if james wins comes in who's going to open uh, with uh, uh, who's going to replace uh, jason roy at the uh, at the opening pair well, I, if I was involved, I would be saying Johnny Bairstow, top of the order, open. That's how I would go. And I think that's the least disruptive way of going. I think it would give them an option. They've got Mo and Ali batting at seven. I think it would give them an option to play another bowler. That's how I would go. I, I think um, move move Bairstow to open um, and bring another bowler into the setup um, to give yourself some, some more bowling options. Mo and Ali, for me, is wasted at number seven. I would bat Mo and Ali at number three. I think that's where he should be in the T20 side. But that's easy for me to say, sat in my armchair watching the game. I'm not in the, you know, the cauldron of the game and, and responsible for that selection. But, you know, Moeen plays such an important role for England. He really, really does. Um, he's so versatile in what he does. He's happy to do anything that the team needs him to do. Um, and, and I'm not being critical of the England selectors or the England captains because I've, I was involved many times in Mo either not playing because we, it was a small ground, we just went with the deal Rashid, or 
we, we moved Mo down the order or we moved him up the order because he's so versatile, so flexible, he can do anything for the England team. And he's shown that. And he's a brilliant, brilliant team man. So my, my selection would be open with Bairstow, move Moeing Ali somewhere into that top six, bring an extra bowler in um, and go that way. That's how I would look to play. Because when you look down the, the, the order for the England team, there's so much batting. You know, all the way down. Wokes is an excellent batter. We saw that, you know, his first scoring shot um, against South Africa on the weekend. Six over long off. Livingston, you know, he, he, a good finisher. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, there's a lot of power. There's a lot of quality in that England team. So that would be the way I would go. And But equally, if they go with James Vince, James Vince is a highly proficient quality player. Um, and he's shown that time and time again. So, it, you know, it just goes to show that England have that strength in depth that they, that they need if you're going to be consistently winning trophies. Talking about two spinners coming from uh, New Zealand, Santa and... Uh, Saudi. Saudi, yes. Yep. Uh, and how well... Uh, I mean, we saw that best how well he can uh, play to the spinners. And yep. uh, like you mentioned, uh, Moin Ali, he's a floater kind of a thing and he's uh, flexible, as you said. But in terms of number three option, it's quite interesting. Kane Williams is, Williamson is not a hard hitter. Stephen Smith is not a really hard hitter. They two, both of them uh, need some time. But whereas... Moin Ali is concerned, he really don't need to take much time. That's a really added advantage. Yeah, and look, I think Moin Ali's stats um, against spin are fantastic. You know, his strike rate against spin, his boundary count against spin is excellent. Um, you know, he um, is such a good striker of a cricket ball. He has a fantastic mentality. When he's at his best, he's about hitting the ball. When he's just thinking about surviving or just looking to play. That's not when he's at his best. When he's looking to hit the ball for four and six, that's when he gets in the best positions. That's when he gets in the best shapes. And that's when he plays his best cricket. So look, I, I, I'm a huge Moe fan. I'd have him at three. And, and if they're going to go with heavy spin attack, I, I think he's the man to uh, to take the opposition spin down. And as you say, Johnny Bairstow, absolutely brilliant against spin. Um, he will have good memories against New Zealand and how he's played against both of those two spinners. They're both high quality. I mean, they are fantastic bowlers, but I, I think he, he will have the upper hand against those two. Wonderful. We will wrap up soon. Uh, I just want to find out, you have coach uh, uh, Chris Walks. He's a local boy here at Warwickshire. And if you look at the warm-up games uh, before the competition against India, he's bowling all over the place and he was hit all over the park. And then he quickly adjusted again, showing some class and experience and uh, never say die attitude. Well, look, there was a long period where Chris Wokes didn't play in the T20 side. And I've been asked that many times, why did we not pick him? And I don't know the answer to that. I can't remember why we didn't pick him. And then I watch him play in this tournament and I think, how did we not pick him? I mean, he, he has been magnificent. I mean, he, he has balanced the England team. Um, you know, he, he has been absolutely brilliant with bat and ball. Um, he dropped a catch the other day, which is most unusual because he really is Mr. England's reliable cricketer in this team. Um, and so, look, it's fantastic that he's playing. It's fantastic he's performing so well. But it shows that the depth that England have. They've not, not been picking him. And during my time, we didn't pick him for three, four years probably in T20 cricket. So it shows the depth. It also shows that when you get into that side, you've got to do well to stay in that side. Because once Owen Morgan picks his 11, he sticks with that 11. He doesn't chop and change. He's not a, a tinkerer with his team. He picks his team. If you're in the first game, you know you're going to stay in. And, and that's what he's done. And that's why England is so consistent. So, you know, Chris Wokes knows this is a huge opportunity and he's not going to miss the opportunity. He's not going to miss his chance. And let's be honest, he's taken it, hasn't he? He's taken it with both hands and done brilliantly well. So, you know, th th this England team are on the verge of doing something nobody else has ever done. Winning both white ball trophies at the same time. It would confirm that Owen Morgan, without a shadow of a doubt, is the best white ball captain in the world. Um, it shows he's very calm under pressure. It shows that his team are well organised, they're well coached. Chris Silverwood has done a brilliant job with his team, done a fantastic job with his team. And it would be great for them to, to win both trophies at the same time because for many years in English cricket, we struggled with competing with the best teams. And certainly in um, overseas conditions, we found it quite hard to win tournaments, win competitions, win series. So look, th this team are consistent, they know what they're doing, they've got a good plan. And as I say, they're well organised, well coached, well led by the best captain, and they've got strength in depth. So, and I hope that it's going to be a good few days for this England team. Your words on Pakistan and Australia, because we have seen that Pakistan sometimes they are the dark horses. They come with the surprise packages. We show off with the Sarfaraz Ahmed's captaincy. They won the uh, competition. Uh, where do you see in terms of um, 
Hayden's coaching impact as well uh, as they go into the next game? Well, I, I don't know about Matthew Hayden's coaching impact. What I would say is that in Sakhalin Mushtaq, they've got a man there who is you know, coaching them, leading that team, who is sensational. And, and you know, Saki worked with us for the England team. He's unbelievably passionate. He's unbelievably well organised. He's a great man. He knows the game inside out. He's played all over the world. Um, he's, he'll have a very calming effect. He, he'll have a very calming effect on that England team. He had a very calming effect on me when I worked with him. I loved working with him. You know, he's just one of those, you know, fantastic blokes in world cricket. And I, I look at that Pakistan side and I think there are so many players in that team that get you on the edge of your seat. We should not be surprised by what Pakistan are capable of. We should not be surprised that they beat India in the way that they did. Um, you know, that the, 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 the two openers are playing as well as anybody is playing white ball cricket. Their stats are absolutely unbelievable. So look, let's not be shocked by Pakistan. Um, you know, as I say, that they've got skill with the ball. Um, Shine Shah Afridi up front. I mean, sensational. I mean, he really is top quality. Um, you know, he 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 has set the pattern, set the trend for those two, for the for the team in the way that they bowled and fielded. Um, and then you look at, as I say, you look at the top two um, in terms of way they play, the way they strike the ball. That they, they go and play with absolutely no fear. Their middle order is packed with high quality, with experience, experience as well. Malik and Hafiz. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Ma- Malik, I mean, sensational the way that he played the other day. So, you know, you, you've, got, you've got high level of skill, you've got high level of um, experience, and you've got people in there who know how to win games of cricket. Their, their team is packed. I mean, if they end up winning this tournament, it shouldn't be a shock. It, it shouldn't be a shock because they have got real high quality. As for Hayden... I've never seen him coach. I don't know what he what, what his coaching skills are. Um, but he, you know, he, he's obviously had some sort of impact. But as I say, you know, in, in Saki, they've got a great man leading that team. Wonderful. Finally, Paul, who's going to make to the finals? Well, I'm going to be very biased and say England. Obviously, um, England Pakistan final would be a brilliant final. It would be an absolutely brilliant final. Um, with England to win, it would be lovely. Wonderful. There we go. A little review and a preview of ICC T20 Cricket World Cup, which is underway in Dubai. I'm with the gentleman, Paul Fabres. Thank you very much. It's an Thank absolute pleasure much. and an honor to be here, Paul. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.